we love you and we thank you. What a time of worship that is. Indeed, you are our Messiah, the Lord of all your grace, your peace, your hope, your joy. Father, we thank you for each and every bit of you that you've poured into us through your Son and through your Spirit. We pray now that you would move as we come again to this text in Isaiah 53. Father, may you teach us something from it. May we see a clear picture of who you are and who you were and who you will one day be. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we look forward to our time with you that lies ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you to open with me to Isaiah chapter 53 as we continue here together uh, in our series. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of time to get there as I tell you why I came to the conclusion I came to about today's message. Uh, Some time ago, I was thinking and, and it occurred to me that many people do not know Jesus because they have no understanding of who he was. They don't know who Jesus is because they have no basis or context as to who Jesus really was. I mean, to really understand somebody, you you not only have to know who they are, but you also have to know who they were. Think about it for a minute. Think about the people you really know. The people you really understand. I mean, the people that you can, can look at and know what they're thinking. The people you can finish a sentence for. The people you can go, I bet I know how he's going to respond to this. Or I bet I know how she's going to respond to that. The people you can give testimony about their character or their integrity. I mean, the people in your life you really, really know. Your list would probably be very similar to my list. Maybe it would include people like your spouse. Now, men, I know we can never really understand the mind of a woman. Um, we, we would never really know what's going to happen. But if you've lived together with your spouse for a while, and ladies, this would be true, too, of, of you and your husband, if you've lived together for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, 30, 40, if God's blessed you with 50 years together, you have a pretty good idea of what's about to happen, don't you? Or, or maybe it's your kids, your children. Uh, you've been with them since they were born. Like, you, you spent a great deal of your life and all of their life together with them. And so, you know each of your children are different. They have different personalities. They respond to things in different ways. They're going to react to a situation in a different way than maybe another child would or maybe even than you would. But you already have a pretty good idea of how that child is going to respond or what that child is going to do because you know who they've been. You know who they were. You know something of their past, and it brings context to the present. Or maybe it's a friend. I'm old enough now that I've had some friends for several decades. Um, I've, I've, I've got friends in my life that have, we've been friends for decades, multiple decades. And I can, just like with my spouse or with my kids, maybe not to that degree, but really close to that degree, I can tell you with great certainty how that friend is going to respond or react or what they're going to say or what they're going to think because I know who they were. I know who they are because of who they were. I know who they are because of the miles that we have already traveled together. You see, we understand and we know these people Because we know who they were yesterday and last week and last month and last year and over the last decades. And that gives us context to who they are. Many people you know right now, some in your family, some are your friends, um, some are people you work with. They do not know who Jesus is. They know the name of Jesus, they've heard of Jesus, but they do not know who Jesus is because they do not know who Jesus was. Now they know the Christmas Jesus that they see on TV when the holidays roll around. They might know the Easter Jesus because somebody drug them to church when they were a kid or because they've showed up at at Easter because that's where they think they need to be at Easter because that's where they went at Easter when they were kids. They might know the secular Jesus. The secular Jesus that has been monetized and popularized and polarized 
but is never, ever under any circumstance in our culture seriously prioritized. They might know that Jesus. They might know the movie screen Jesus or the TV show Jesus. But they don't know the biblical Jesus. They do not know the real Jesus. They do not know the Jesus that can save them from their sins and bring transformation to their lives. They know a picture of Jesus or a shadow of Jesus or a a, a glimpse of Jesus, but they don't know Jesus because they have no idea who he was. Therefore, they can have no idea of who he is. It's important that you know who somebody was so you can really understand who they are. The more you know about who Jesus was, the more you'll understand who he really is today in the present. Today we're going to look at two more verses here in Isaiah 53. And again, here in Isaiah, some 700 years before Jesus would even be born, he predicts six specific things about who Jesus was going to be. And he shows us six specific things about who Jesus was that lead us to a reality of who Jesus is. Some of these things, many of these things, we've already spoken a great deal about in our series. This is somewhat, in my mind, the Spirit of God in Isaiah recapping what has already been covered so far in our text. So we're going to move very quickly through these points because next time we're together here in this chapter, we're going to get to the climax of it all. So he's kind of recapping everything, and then we're about to get to the climax next time we're together here in this text. Let's read verses 8 and 9, our text for today, and then we will unpack these six things about who Jesus was. Isaiah 53, verse 8, He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck Because of my people's rebellion, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death. Because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Today I'm going to ask you a question at the end of each of our six points. You know it is my custom or or my rhythm, so to speak, to give you a big idea in every sermon. And then I tend to repeat that big idea throughout the sermon particularly at the end of each point, I usually will come back to that big idea. Today, at the end of each point, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask you to answer the question out loud. And, and I know some y'all are looking at me the way the, the early service did. They're going, I don't want to talk to myself. Like, I want to talk out loud. And then tell your neighbor. If, if you feel silly talking to yourself and just saying it out loud, you can look at your neighbor, and you can answer your neighbor the question. But I'm going to ask you a question. And it, Don't worry, it's going to be multiple choice, okay? I'm going to make this real easy. It's a multiple choice. I've framed every question where there's only two possible answers, okay? The first answer is, no, he was not. And the second answer is our big idea for today, yes, he was. I'm going to ask you the question, and then I'm going to ask you to consider the question and decide, was he or was he not what it is we have spoken of? So I want to prepare you for that when it comes at the, each, the end of each point. Point number one for today is this. First thing Isaiah reminds us of yet again is that he was a suffering servant. Isaiah called it. He predicted it. He brought it to light long before the Lord brought it to bear in his life. Isaiah said he would suffer, and we have said much of this point already in our series because Isaiah has covered it extensively. In fact, in almost every verse here in this chapter, he talks something about the suffering that this servant, Christ, would endure. If you back up to verse 3 with me, you'll see he said he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sufferings, he calls him, who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. In verse 4, he goes on to say, Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. Again, we see his suffering as he carried those sicknesses and those pains. 
In verse 5 he said, but he was pierced, suffering again because of our rebellion. Crushed, suffering yet again because of our iniquities. Punishment, suffering yet again for our peace was on him and we were healed by his wounds, his suffering. Isaiah 53, 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Oppressed and afflicted, suffering yet again. In fact, in virtually every verse of this chapter, there are two great themes that emerge. The servant that Christ would be and the suffering that Christ would endure. You see those throughout this text. You cannot miss it if you read it closely or even casually. So we're not surprised to see it come before us again here in verse 8 where the prophet says he was taken away because of oppression and judgment and who considered his fate. Oppression and judgment produce suffering. If you have ever been oppressed or judged, you know something of the suffering that accompanies it. You know something of this kind of pain. You know something of this feeling. You know something of this agony. You know something of this hardship and the pure misery that comes with oppression and judgment. Jesus was indeed someone who suffered in many ways as the Lamb of God. He was a suffering servant. And knowing who he is starts with knowing who he was. So I will ask you this morning, and you tell me, you decide, you consider the question, and I pray you will answer it out loud with a bold voice. I'll encourage those of you who are at home or those of you who can just hear my voice now to answer it wherever you may be as well. Make your choice. Was he a suffering servant? Yes, he was. Or no, he wasn't. There are only two options. Number two, he was slaughtered. You can say he was crucified and be accurate. You can say he was killed and you would be correct. You can say he was eliminated and you would be right. You can say he was murdered and you would not be wrong. And you can say he was slaughtered and that too is factual and very precise. No matter how you say it, the reality is he was unjustly tried. He was falsely accused. Jesus was wrongfully convicted and he was viciously exterminated on the cross of Calvary. Isaiah said it like this in verse 8, For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was killed. Everyone on earth may not realize he was slaughtered for the sins of the world, but I can tell you this, everybody in heaven knows it. They understand who he is because they know who he was, and they know what he did, and they know how he died. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, as we get a glimpse into heaven, as we peer in the Apostle John's vision and visit to that holy place, he reports this to us in verse 9. And they sang a new song, and this new song starts with three important words, you are worthy. And those words do not belong to you, they do not belong to me, they do not belong to our church, they belong to the Lamb of God who is worthy. He says this new song begins with, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered. And you purchased people for God by your blood. Let that sink into your heart. You purchased people For God, by your blood, not with silver and gold, not with prayers and incense, with your very blood you purchased them for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation this purchase was made. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on earth. If you jump down to verse 12, it says this, They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Yes, indeed, Jesus was cut off from the land of the living. The sinless, perfect Lamb of God was slaughtered for the sins of the world. And in an instant, everything changed when the Bible records this 
in places like Luke 23, 46. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit, saying this, he breathed his last. So I'll ask you, and you have to decide and answer the question for yourself. I cannot answer it for you. I'll encourage you to answer this second question aloud again. Make your choice. Was Jesus slaughtered for the sins of the world? Number three, he was struck. He was struck. By show of hands, anybody here like to just get punched in the face? I didn't think so. I certainly don't want to get punched in the face. I mean, does anybody like just a good old kick in the stomach? You know, one of those kicks when you're like on the ground and somebody just really, I mean, just lays into you, breaks a couple of ribs. I mean, anybody enjoy that? Swift kick to the belly never feels good, does it? I mean, have any of you ever in your entire life, and I'm looking at y'all, some of y'all been living a long time. Any of you ever woke up and just said, you know what? This morning, with my cup of coffee, you know what I think I'd really like to start my day with? A broken nose and a couple of knocked out teeth. That'd be a great way to get this day going. Of course not. We don't want to be struck. We don't want to be hit. We don't want to be knocked down or knocked out. No one wants to be hit like that. But what does Isaiah say? He says this in verse 8, he was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was struck, but there's even more to it than that. He was struck for you and struck for me. He was struck for my rebellion and sin. He was struck for your rebellion and sin, not for his own. It was your rebellion, our rebellion, my rebellion that brought on this beating and this mistreatment for Christ. One commentator said of this verse, both his sorrows and his death are directly connected to the sins of others. Think about that. He wasn't just struck. He wasn't just beaten. He was beaten and struck for you. Listen, personally, I never want to get beaten. I, I just, I, I, I'm not something I look forward to. It's not something I try to make happen. It's not something I'm ever going to seek out in my life, a good beating. But if I am going to get beaten, it's going to be my fault that I get beaten. I'm not taking a beating for y'all. I'll give you a good example. I mean, some of y'all want to get on to me about this or whatever. That's fine. But I'm going to tell you, I, I, I lived in the dorm in college. And I can remember an instance we were playing dominoes and ping pong and foosball. We had this big lobby area down on the bottom floor of our dorm. And we would gather in there at all hours of the day and night. We would play these games, cards, whatever. There was always stuff going on. And we were down there one night, and there were some people playing dominoes. I wasn't playing dominoes, but one of my good friends was playing dominoes from the dorm. And we had some football players that lived in our dorm. These were big old guys, right? I'm not a small guy. I'm just an average guy, though. I was a lot smaller in college than I am even now. But we were, we were down there. I was playing ping pong or foosball or something else. My friend was playing dominoes with some of these football players. And we had this one football player. I won't call him by his name because I, I don't want to, you know, embarrass him if some of y'all might know him or something. You probably wouldn't. But he had a bad mouth on him. And he loved to antagonize people. He was a bully. He was a verbal bully more than anything. But he just, he knew nobody was going to mess with him because he was big. I mean, I'm talking big like Dustin Big, Jason Big. Combine Jason and Dustin, and that's how big this dude was. He was big and bulky and strong. And my friend over there, he was smaller than me, and he had 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 enough of it. He was losing in the game. He was frustrated. And so he started mouthing back off to this guy, and this guy stood up and looked down at him, kind of like Goliath, and said, what you going to do about it? And he smarted back off to him, told him how he was going to whoop him and all this other stuff, using, you know, not language I would use in church. And then he looked at his shoulder over me and said, Pete. And I said, what? He did that. And I did this. (laughs) And later, nothing happened. Later, he got on to me. He said, I thought we were friends, man. 
You should come help me. I said, dude, that would, God would have killed both of us. I helped you not get a beating by not coming to your aid. If I would have come to your aid in that moment, we would have both got beaten. And I ain't getting beaten for you. I didn't do nothing to that guy. I didn't have any skin in that game. So I saved your hide and my hide at the same time. Because without me backing you up, he didn't have the confidence to go forward with his claim. Made him look bad, but I didn't get beaten that night. And I'm glad I didn't get beaten that night. I'm just telling you, I ain't taking a beating for you. Not a one of you does, are worthy of getting beaten, me getting beaten for you. And you probably wouldn't take a beating for me either, would you? I don't want to get beat, but if I am going to get beat, it's not going to be for somebody else. But that's exactly what Jesus did. And it was a vicious, vicious beating. The Gospels record it in different places. I'll just read to you from Mark 14, 64 through 65. You've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They all condemned him as deserving death, and then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, Prophesy. The temple servants also took him and slapped him. Yes, indeed, Isaiah was right when he said he was struck because of our rebellion. Once again, I have a question for you. It's your turn to decide and answer. Was he struck? Yes, he was. Number four, he was sharing a grave. He was sharing a grave. The language here is somewhat problematic and that it can be translated a few different ways, this part of the verse here in Isaiah. That being said, many biblical scholars and theologians have suggested that Jesus was likely originally going to be buried and disposed of in the same manner as the two thieves who died beside him. But before that happened, he was laid in a rich man's tomb. And that's what we see Isaiah predict. I mean, these two things don't seem to match up. They don't seem like they can be reconciled, but indeed they were He was assigned, verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with the rich man at his death. The Bible doesn't give us all of the details about many things, and this is one of them where we're simply left to trust God and lean on his understanding, not our own. We can, however, piece together a decent picture of the events that took place. In John 19, for example, it says this of these moments. Starting in verse 31, since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a special day. This doesn't just concern the body of Jesus. They didn't want any bodies on the cross. They wanted all the bodies off the cross before the sun went down. They wanted the thieves off the cross. They wanted Jesus off the cross. They wanted those crosses cleared before the Sabbath began. And so they requested that Pilate have these men's legs broken so that their bodies could be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. Normally, crucifixion was something that the Romans wanted to last a really long time. This is what made it such a terrifying way to be tortured and ultimately killed. It was because of the amount of time that your death took to take place. Your agony on the cross, should you find yourself there, could last a really, really long time. But the Jews wanted this to be over before the sun went down, so they cut the agony of these thieves down considerably by breaking their legs You see, if you don't have your legs when you're hanging on a cross, it speeds up the process of your suffocation. Because you can't push up to get a breath. You can't push up to breathe. And so once your legs are broken or fail to work, your time will quickly come to an end. It stands to reason that they would have, without the intervention of Joseph, 
because the Jews wanted these bodies off the cross before the Sabbath began, it comes to a place where we can reason that they would have done with Jesus' body the same thing they did with these thieves. They would have simply quickly, crudely, and rudely disposed of them. Some have suggested they would go so far as just to dump the bodies in what we might consider the local garbage dump. Certainly there wouldn't have been a long preparation time. There wouldn't have been mourning. There, there, there wouldn't have been a great ceremony or pomp and circumstance. They would have simply just been disposed of as quickly, as cheaply, and as crudely as possible. They were, after all, rebels and thieves. They didn't deserve anything better. So the plan was likely just to dump the body of Christ someplace along with these criminals. Thus, according to Isaiah, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. But we know that's not what happened. Matthew said this in Matthew 27, 57, When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Great story in and of itself right there. He approached Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. And then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there facing the tomb. So again, 700 years before Christ... Isaiah was right. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but in the end, he was with the rich man at his death. So again, it's your turn to answer the question. Was Jesus placed in a borrowed tomb? You see, if we really want to know who Jesus is, we must know who he was. Look with me at this next one. He was sinless. He was sinless. The prophet Isaiah said it like this in verse 9, and we've again talked at great length about this together through this series, so we won't spend a great deal of time here, but for the sake of recap, let us cover this part of verse 9, where it says, because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. There was absolutely no sin in Jesus. No deceit, no violence, no wickedness, no lust. Nothing, none, zero, zilch, none of it. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23. He did not commit sin. I don't know how to make it any plainer. The Word of God says it plainly. He did not commit sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who did not know sin, he did not know sin at all, to be sin for us. Let that sink in. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He did not know sin. 1 John 3, verse 5. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins and there is no sin in him. No sin in him. In the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, even Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. Of course not, because he was sinless. There can be no guilt where there is no sin. So let me see if you're ready to answer this question. Was Jesus sinless? So let's sum it all up with this last point. We'll take the entirety of verses 8 through 10 here with this last point which sums up all of these two verses and the first part of verse 10 which we will get to in our next hour together. And that is this. He was God's sovereign plan. Isaiah says he was taken away because of oppression and judgment. 
And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Now look with me into the first part of verse 10. And again, we will deal with this in more detail, this climax of the entire chapter as we bring our series to a close next time. Look at what this next verse starts by saying, Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. I will not pretend to understand this. I will not pretend to be able to fully explain this. But I do know this points to one thing. Ultimately, it points to one incredible thing. Jesus was God's sovereign plan. This is proclaimed throughout God's holy word. I'll share just a few examples with you for the sake of time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-21 through 21, For you know that you were redeemed for your, from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold. How were you redeemed? With the precious blood of Christ. Like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, because... He was sinless. Verse 20, listen to this. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. He was God's sovereign plan. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. He was God's sovereign plan. Paul said this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, praise God, because they're all rubbish, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, guess when? Before time began, because he was God's sovereign plan. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Light, life, immortality, and the abolishment of death are only possible through the blood of Jesus Christ and the gospel he came to bring. Paul says this is now evident through the appearing of Christ because we know that it was God's sovereign plan. I'll close with this one in Galatians chapter 4, verses 3-7. through 7. It says, in the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of this world. And then verse 4 says, when the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. I love the way some other translations capture verse 4. My translation says, when the time came to completion. In other words, this was God's sovereign plan. But I love, for example, the way the ESV captures it. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. When the fullness of time had come. In other words, when it was just the right time, God sent Jesus to die for you and to die for me. Jesus was God's sovereign plan. Isaiah had eyes to see it, ears to hear it. He had the Spirit of God to sense it, and he had a pen and a paper to write it down 700 years before Jesus would ever breathe a breath on this planet. Somehow he knew that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to be God's sovereign plan for all of humanity. The question is not, did Isaiah know it? We know he knew it. He wrote it down. The question is, do you know it? Do your friends know it? Do your family know it? Do your coworkers know it? And so we have arrived again at the place where you have to answer a question. Was Jesus God's sovereign plan? There's only two answers to that question. Yes, he was, or no, he wasn't. So here's the deal. If Jesus was indeed, as you have indicated to me today, if he was indeed a suffering servant, if he was indeed slaughtered on the cross of Calvary, 
If Jesus was struck by his enemies, if he did indeed share a grave that was not his own but was a borrowed tomb, if he was indeed the sinless Lamb of God, and if Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is God's sovereign plan for the world, if you truly believe that's who he was, then you have to agree that Jesus is the Savior for all humanity. So is he your Savior? Have you believed in him for salvation? Have you trusted in him for forgiveness? Have you repented of your sins and claimed the blood of Christ? Has your name been written in the Lamb's book of life? If not, call out to him right now. Call out to him this hour. Pray, repent, receive him as your Lord and Savior. Be saved from your sins this very hour. Now that you know who he was, you cannot possibly deny who he is. Let's pray. If that is you and you are here and you have never called on Jesus, if you can hear my voice and you have never called, confessed, and cried out to Christ for your salvation, I pray you would do it right now. We don't ask you to stand, raise a hand, walk an aisle. Just pray with us. This prayer of repentance. Say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I have gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would change me. Lord, I repent of my sins And I give my life and my heart and all that I am to you. Transform me from the inside out as only you can do. Make me into a new creation so that I can honor you and glorify you with the rest of my life. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness. I thank you for your patience and your love. I thank you for showing me who you were so I can really know who you are. Father, as we close today, I thank you for these who have gathered here today to worship you in spirit and truth. May you bless them for their devotion, their dedication, their discipline, and their desire to honor you with their worship, with their presence here in your house. Lord, I pray that you have spoken to them and I pray that you will continue to do so in the hours that follow our service and the days that come between now and when we gather again. May your sweet, soft whisper ever be upon them and may they feel your presence wherever you should lead them and take them. Lord, may this good news of who you were and who you are not stay with us. Lord, I pray we would share it, we would spread it. Father, I pray we would proclaim it, that we would live it, and that we would be a reflection of it wherever we go in the hours that follow. Lord, we love you, we thank you. We ask your blessing now on our lives, on our families, on this church, and on whatever mission you have for us in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, before we are dismissed.